But today, I want to start with Psalm 113. Psalm 113. Psalm 113 talks about the grace of God. Anybody experienced the grace of God this week? Grace of God is pervasive in our life. And I think, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I forget that the grace of God surrounds me wherever I go. And it's easy to forget that God is there and God is watching over us and God is caring for us and providing for us. And so Psalm 113 talks about the grace of God. The word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forever, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heaven and in the earth? He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit as princes with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house and the, as a joyful mother of children. Let us praise the Lord. Pray with me, please. Lord God, you are to be praised. You are worthy of praise. You deserve all of our praise. We think of all the things that you have done for us, Lord, all the blessings of life, even from breath early in the morning, the ability to come in a country and worship you out in the open, to be able to teach your word, to understand your word, the gift of having the spirit inside of us to call us to accountability and to teach us in those quiet moments. Lord, we have great grace given to us. Make us a people of even more celebrating your grace. Make us a people that talk about your grace wherever we go. Wherever we go, whoever we meet, hears a word about you and about how blessed we are because of our relationship with you. All good things come from the Father above. We learn that from your word. We experience it in our life. Even the ability to pray to you, the great God of the universe, the creator of all things, and have great confidence in that you listen to us, that you take care of us through words, that you take care of us through the hands of your people. You lay out a clean, straight path in front of us, and the end is glory, your glory, where we look forward to seeing you face to face. What a joy that is going to be. Lord, let us be people of grace and let us bring others to understand your grace in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading of the word today is from John chapter 9, verses 17 to 41. They said, therefore, to the man blind, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews, therefore, did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how now does he see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But not how he sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age. He shall speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, 
For the Jews has already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents asked, he, or parents said, he is of age, ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He therefore answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that where I was blind before, now I see. They said therefore to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? And they reviled him. And they said, you are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, You are entirely born in your sins, and you are teaching us. And they put him out. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, and who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word and its exposition today. Lord, that you would teach us through your spirit what we are to gain from this passage, what we are to learn from this passage, how we should apply it to our own lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Last week we looked at the opening part of this scene in John chapter 9. What did we see? We saw a, a man who was born blind. And beside the road, and as Jesus and the disciples were leaving the temple, walking down the road, they run into this guy. And the disciples have a question for him. Who sinned? His parents? Or him personally, that he would be born blind? Jesus has to educate them that it's nothing to do with sin, that this reason why this guy was blind. And as we covered last week, we realized that he was blind for a purpose. He was blind in order to show the glory of God. That's why he was blind. And we looked at how these events that may happen in our life should be looked at when we have difficult things happening to us or friends or family or things in the world, we have to realize things happen for a purpose and for God's purposes. But we go back to this scene this week because we want to see the reaction of the Pharisees, the reaction of the Jews to this miracle. Would they be overjoyed that a miracle had happened in front of them in their territory or would they be critical of it and try to discredit everybody in the scene? We know the answer to that. We've seen this pattern happen again. John chapter 6, John chapter 7, John chapter 8. Miracles occur and the, uh, Jesus is persecuted, chased, run out of places. Stones picked up to stone him because they do not like the message. It's messing with their plan. They had everything with God all figured out. They knew the plan. And Jesus was messing up their plan. 
And the intensity just grows more and more and more as the chapters go on. We're not that far before they will determine that they are going to kill him and put the plan in place to do that. But the question today, the title of the message today is True Faith. What does true faith look like to you? Do you have an example in your mind? Boy, I know this person. They really have faith. They have true faith. It's genuine faith. Anybody have a name of somebody? Maybe it's a friend or a family member that just exhibits that kind of faith. And you're going, wow, that's an example of, of good faith. What characteristics do they show? How do you understand them to have good faith? Have you seen them go through difficult situations and remain faithful? Do you see them do things like pray often or always out caring for people or always encouraging people who are in difficult cir circumstances or situations? What does true faith look like? What we see here in the man who has been changed by the Lord, given new eyes, we see this great example of true faith. And I love the pieces of this puzzle as we uncover it to show what true faith looks like. On the other side of the house, you have lack of faith shown pretty good here as well. You have what unbelief looks like. You have aspects of what's in the Jews here that tell us what in the kingdom looks like and what out of the kingdom looks like. Therefore, it should be very instructive for us to be able to evaluate people in our midst to know whether or not they have faith or not. Is it just lip service? Or are there things behind their lips where they confess the Lord that is important to see? We've talked about that a lot in the last year as we've been going through the Gospel of John. We get another version of that here, but very, very descriptive version of this. Jesus said this in Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Three specific things. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What does that mean to you? Do you do that? Do you deny yourself? Do you take up his cross daily? And do you follow him? How about those examples you had in your life of who that faithful person was? Do you see that in their life? Yeah, that person denies himself. That person takes up his cross daily. That guy follows Jesus. Do you do that? What does it even mean to do those kind of things? These are questions that we have when we read this passage. And we could go at length about what each of those th three are. And some of those we've talked about in different ways as we've gone through the early parts of John. We have to look at it and see. And I think this guy, this newfound guy with newfound eyes, I think he is an example It does all of those three things. And so maybe we can look at our own life and say, do I do those things? Or do I need to teach people how to do those things, to be a true believer, one who has true faith? They start by going after the blind man again, John 9, 17. So they said to the blind man, what do you say about him that he opened your eyes? The response back he is a prophet. The guy says he is a prophet. Let me ask you a question. Has he, has he actually seen Jesus yet? He acts, has, he, has he put his eyes on Jesus? Jesus runs into him. He's a blind man, right? <laughs> Jesus puts spittle onto some clay, puts it on his eyes, tells him to go wash. He goes and does exactly what Jesus says. Said he came back seeing. We don't even know if he actually saw the disciples after this event or saw the Lord. All we know is that the Jews and his neighbors saw him. We don't even know if he's seen Jesus. And yet, he calls him a prophet. 
What was the significance of a prophet? Who sent a prophet? Who sent the prophets for us? Who sent the prophets in the Old Testament? God the Father sent the prophets. God sent the prophets. He is committing to these guys that this guy, Jesus, is a prophet from God. God is the origin of Jesus' ministry. Right out of the get-go, he has this proclamation. How did he get that information? Did he sit at Jesus' feet for a couple of years and figure that out? Was he listening to the conversation from the disciples as the spittle was being made and the clay was put on there? Or did he get divine information from God to say, listen to Jesus, he is a prophet? He got direct information. He knows inherently that Jesus is a prophet. And so I put in the notes, he not only got physical eyes, he got spiritual eyes. When he encountered the Lord, spiritual wisdom showed up in his life. Otherwise, he doesn't say that he's a prophet. And it's very interesting. In 1 John 4, 2 and 3, I love this passage where John later on explains this. He said, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. This is what this guy did. He confessed that Jesus comes from, come from God and therefore the spirit has impacted his life. But the flip side of that is... John continues in 1 John 4, verse 3, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. If the man confessed Jesus as a prophet from God, who is the group that did not confess Jesus is from God? Who is the group that is part of the spirit of the Antichrist? It's the Jews, right? You remember what Jesus called them just a little bit ago in chapter 8? Children of the devil. And now John concludes that these guys are the spirit of the Antichrist. They are against Jesus. The thing that's interesting about this is not only is Jesus a prophet, but he is the promised prophet. The one that was prophesied by Moses all the way back in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where Moses says, The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. Jesus was that fulfillment in our life, the fulfillment in the life of Jerusalem, and definitely the fulfillment of that in a guy who was born blind. The man knows that Jesus is a prophet. But what about the Jews? The Jews don't know that Jesus was a prophet. They don't believe that Jesus was a prophet. I spoke of examples of your family and friends that have true faith. What about those that do not have faith in Jesus? What characteristics do they show in their life? Certainly you know somebody that's not in the kingdom, right? <laughs> Certainly you have somebody in your family that's not in the kingdom. Certainly you have some friends that are not in the kingdom. If not, I need to get you some new friends. <laughs> It's tough to do ministry when everybody's in the kingdom, right? We're supposed to reach out to others. Go grab yourself some unbelieving friends and have some conversations. Make friendships like that. Do that. Easy to do when you're a teenager in school. My guess is lots of opportunity exists to make friends with those who are not believers. So we should do that. But what does it look like? What does it look like in the Jews? The next two verses in John 9. The Jews did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight, until they called the parents 
of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How does now he see? What do you do when you're questioning information? You're looking for more evidence. How many times have they already talked to this guy about what had happened? Two other times. But now they're asking him again, what happened? What happened? What happened? Why do you continue to ask the same question of what happened? If you're an investigator and you've got a suspect in front of you, why do you want them to continue to tell the story? What are you looking for? You're looking for differences in the story, right? Well, he said it was green last time. This time he said it was blue. Now I can discredit the witness because his story is changing. It's not consistent. So if you're an investigator, you're continuing to look and poke and prod. And now you're going to bring in his parents. Now I need some more evidence. I'm trying to get a lot of evidence because i got to discredit this guy. How many of you ever heard of a story where a prosecutor is dead set that somebody is guilty and they are going to continue to try to find information to prove it? Even when they're faced with truth, 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 not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. They do whatever they can to try to find guilt so they can convict somebody even if they're innocent. That wouldn't happen in our world, would it? That wouldn't happen in our country, would it? Put somebody who's not guilty behind bars? Why would we do that? Because I want to close the case. I want the pride to be able to pat myself on the back. I found him. He's guilty. He's in jail now. Whether he's innocent or not, I don't care because I just did my job. So these guys are looking for corroborating information. And there's a part in scripture that says that that's what you should do. You may have heard this phrase where two or three are gathered in my Name. Anybody heard that before? Where two or three are gathered in my name. I hear that sometimes around prayer meetings where like only a few people are showing up. That's not the intent of the passage. The passage is to corroborate information in a tribunal. You need two or three witnesses. And I have great confidence if you are by yourself in prayer... Jesus is there with you. You don't need to call Kent over and say, hey, you better show up, otherwise Jesus is not here. It's not the way it works, right? It doesn't make sense. But they're corroborating information. They're looking, hey, i got to find somebody else. And so you can see it from that perspective. But they don't believe Jesus is a prophet. They actually, earlier in, in John 8, called him from the devil. How are they going to think he's a prophet if they think he's from the devil his case is already cooked. We've got to figure out a way to frame this guy. I don't like what he's doing. Even though he's never committed any sin, I've got to find something that will stick so I can get rid of him because he doesn't fit my path. He doesn't fit our plan. <laughs> when Jesus cast out demons out of somebody, what did the Jews say? He cast out demons by Beelzebub. The reason why he got the demons to leave is because he's part of the demon crew and he just ordered them out. You can find that in Matthew 12, verse 24. Jesus was a demon guy, not a God guy. But twice they asked this blind man who has new eyes. Twice he answered them. And now they want to ask again. They're trying to exert pressure on him. So what do they do? They call in his parents. Certainly the parents will be able to give me the straight information. If they're honest investigators, that's what they would say. But they're looking for information in order to frame Jesus. Why do they ask the parents to come in here? They don't really have an ability to influence the guy born blind. Maybe they have a way that they can put pressure on the parents. In John 9, 20 to 25, his parents answered and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. How now he sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age and he will speak for himself. He is of age. That means he's at least 13 years old. He's gone through bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah means son of the law, meaning that he's under the law. He has the responsibility to fulfill the law. Therefore, you can ask him any question. If he lies to you, he's punishable by the law. 
<laughs> the parents are like, no, no, no. <laughs> Pass the buck. You talk to him. Why would the parents do that? Why would they pass the buck? Because of fear. The very next line John lets us know. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. The Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was going to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, don't ask me, ask him. I don't want to be put on the spot for this. What would put out of the synagogue mean? You think about this. Jim and I have a discussion that doesn't go very well. And I say, Jim, you need to get out of the church. You're out. <laughs> I want you out of here. Jim's like, fine. I'll go find myself another church. <laughs> Someplace better. I'll walk down the street. I'll go to another place and I'll just worship there. It's nice to be able to have options in the United States of America. In any community, there's another church for you to do that. That wasn't the case in the synagogue. It was the center point of a lot of different things. It was a center point of worship, worship that was controlled by the Jews and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was a center point of interaction socially as well. Our church does very well to interact socially, right? We get together on Wednesday night. We do movie night. We have lots of opportunities to get together. We're going to have fellowship events at the lake. We live life together. That's the beauty of having a church is to live life together. Not all churches are like that, by the way. Bigger cities, places we've been before, it was a struggle to get people to get together, but not here. This is the center of life. It's more like the synagogue in the, in the biblical times. It was the center of life. But there's another aspect of that. It was also the center of commerce. It was also the center of business. It's where you made business connections. You hung out at the temple where Brian and I could come out at the temple and go like, hey, I got a job for you. And he'll go, great. I mean, I'll do this. And we work, and it's a commercial situation. We make our contacts and interactions, right? If this guy had parents that are of working age, and they were plugged into the synagogue, and they had businesses, they had a farm, or they were a service guy that did service for people in the community, and they were cut out of the synagogue, there goes their livelihood. There, goes their, there go, goes their income stream. Not only socially, but financially. How about socially? Let's say the, the parents have another son who's of prime age, and you know there's a, another couple in the synagogue that has a nice, beautiful girl, and they want to set up a little arranged marriage and, and get that going aspect of it. That's not going to happen if you're out of the synagogue because they're going to say, no, 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 can't interact with that person. Can't even speak with that person. This is a pressure point on them. And if the parents find out and confess that Jesus is Christ and they're put out of the synagogue, game over on their life. Game over. And so, yeah, I want to put pressure on the parents. How did the parents do? What did they say? I don't know. <laughs> Ask him. I don't want to be under this pressure. I don't want to have to support Jesus and get the, the possibility of getting kicked out of the synagogue. One, they weren't even there when it happened. But two, yeah, they probably believe their son, but they're certainly not going to support the son in the midst of this kind of pressure from the police. And it's very interesting to see how they treat that, where they just pass the buck and say, go talk to him. What kind of an example of faith do the parents have? Interesting. So what do we do with this situation? How do we understand that in our own life? The combination of these three different groups of people. You have the Pharisees and the Jews, they don't believe. You have the man that's born blind and has new sight. You have his reaction. Then you have the parents' reaction. You've probably heard the term before. It's called excommunication. When you're excommunicated, your prosperity goes out the window. What churches do you know now that still do excommunication? 
They actually shun you if you break the rules and they kick you out. In this day, this modern age day, if I would have asked that question about 20 years ago, you would probably have said Catholicism, <laughs> right? Catholics, they would do that. But even today, that's kind of muted. Because the church so much wants funds to come into the church, they don't want to kick anybody out. <laughs> so they won't even do that. How about an Amish community? You think an Amish community will still shun people? Yeah, maybe so. Some of the Mennonite groups, some of the Amish groups, they'll still hold fast to the word and excommunicate people from the church. We wouldn't do that today. It's very rare to do that in the modern day in a Baptist church or a Methodist church. Wouldn't happen. But back then, boy, the pressure would be put on. In essence, they are being persecuted for their belief, persecuted for their faith. And this guy is under threat of being excommunicated. Think about where he is in his life. Think about this. He's been a beggar. He's been blind since birth. He's been hanging out as a beggar. What kind of financial prospects do you have as a beggar? What kind of, what kind of social prospects? prospects do you have about getting married if you're a beggar? You can't even hold a job because you can't see. <laughs> Who's going to marry off a, a good wife to somebody who has those kind of financial prospects in that kind of social setting? It's not going to happen. This guy's got nothing to lose, right? Of course he's going to stand up for Jesus. He's got nothing to lose. But think about it. He's got a new set of eyes. What's in front of him? I can get a job now. I can build a house. I can be productive in the community. I'm going to be able to make some money, build a little business, have some standing in the community. I got a chance where I might actually be attractive for somebody to marry off their daughter to. I'm on the cusp. I'm on the beginning of a brand new life. My eyes are just wide open. I can do all of these great things. And yet with all that prospect in front of him, how does he react? What does he say? Does he even think about what he could do in the future? Interesting, isn't it? What does he do? John 9, verses 24 to 25. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They have already said that Jesus was a sinner. Was Jesus a sinner? No, he wasn't a sinner. It's very interesting to see what they wanted this guy to do, give glory to God. What was the guy doing, by the way? What was he saying about Jesus? Jesus was a prophet? He healed me. He gave me a new set of eyes. You know what the guy was doing? Giving glory to God, right? <laughs> My easy answer to be that is like, what I've what I've been doing, man. Give glory to God. I am doing, giving glory to God. What are you criticizing me for? I'm doing exactly as you asked, except they didn't see Jesus as God. But he answers and says, whether he is a sinner, I do not know, in verse 25. One thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. Every time I read that line, I think of the lyrics to Amazing Grace, right? I once was blind, and now I see. Amazing Grace, it is. The Jews say we know that this man is a sinner. Well, they're the children of the devil. They're not going to accept Jesus no matter what he does. But what's interesting is the guy. He said, I was blind and now I see. On the face of persecution, what does he do? He tells his story. I tell people when they come to Christ, evangelism is really easy. You know, people think it's difficult to talk to people about the Lord. Here's an example of a guy brand new to Christ. Did you see him go through the entire Old Testament? with these guys and prove that Jesus was the Christ? 
Did you see him pull out memorized verses? Did he pull out a tract and say, here's the plan of salvation? <laughs> no, what does he say? I was blind, and now I see. And I encourage people that your story is your first evangelism. If he changed your life, just talk about your life. Just say what happened to you. You've heard the story before that I did prison ministry for a number of years. And I tell the story in my testimony that 10 days after I figured out the Lord was in my life, I went into prison. And I started witnessing in prison. And a guy said, I'm doing a prison ministry. You want to go? And I'm like, well, this thing's brand new to me. I guess I'll go along with you. And I go into prison. He plops me down in front of four people and says, go ahead, man. They had given me a 20-minute training around a tract called the Four Spiritual Laws. Anybody know what the Four Spiritual Laws are? <laughs> right? So what do I do? I'm going like, we're not doing that. <laughs> I'm not going to remember anything in that tract. I said, guys, let me just tell you what happened to me. This is, I'm still trying to figure it out, but let me tell you what happened to me. That was my first evangelism event, Brian. The superstar, right? You know what happened? Four guys bowed down and asked the Lord into their life. Set me on fire for evangelism my whole life. If it's that easy, all i got to do is talk about what happened in my life. I'm in. And that's what this guy does. Though I was blind, now I see. Very interesting that that's a simple message. But he doesn't stop there with these guys. I have in the sermon notes, the pupil becomes the teacher. What did he do? He's going to go proclaim what's on his heart. He's going to proclaim what's on his heart. What does he say? Jesus changed my life. And I put in the notes, how many of you have said that to somebody before? After you came to faith in Christ, how many of you have said, Jesus changed my life to somebody else? We tend to forget that joy of first salvation, the first time we realized Jesus loves me, the first time we realize that forgiveness of sin is available, the first time you realize that your future is with God in heaven where you will see the King of glory face to face. Are you feeling me, Brooke? When you first realize it, what do you want to do? You want to tell somebody about that. I remember this guy who lived next to, next to us who bought this brand new Cadillac one day. And he brings it into the driveway, and I'm out mowing the lawn and caring for some trees and stuff like that. He goes, hey, plumber, plumber, come on over here. I want to show you my new car. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's me sit inside. You know that new car smell that just kind of wafts over you a little bit? He says, you want to take it out for a ride? I'm going like, well, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm a little smelly. I don't want to do that. Maybe later, maybe we can go out for a ride in your new car. A month later parking out there. I'm in the yard. I'm like, how's that new car? And you're like, oh, the new car? Yeah, well, it's a month old now. <laughs> it's not a new car anymore. I've already shown it off to everybody who I knew. I've already taken all the drives. It's just an old, it's just a car now. It gets me from here to be. It's a good car. I made a good deal, but eh, no big deal. I said, you want to take me for a ride in it? It's like, no. <laughs> it's just a car. Some people treat Jesus that way, right? When you're first there and you get brand new excitement, you want to tell everybody about Jesus, and then the months go by, and you're like, yeah, he's just the Lord and Savior. <sighs> this guy wasn't going to do that. He wanted people to know he had a changed life. And he's going to the police, contrary to one of their laws, and is going right at them and is going to tell the story. John 9, 26 and 27, so they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them and said, I told you already and you don't want to listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Boy, that's a very interesting line. Again, the Jews in interrogate him and they prompt him. How did he get new eyes? 
Maybe they wanted to hear the story again to corroborate the first two times he said something where they're looking for things. Like I said earlier, maybe they were trying to figure out what work Jesus did so they can laugh to another accusation at him for working on the Sabbath. The guys who listen say, I told you already, and you don't want to listen. This is unbelief. When somebody tells you the truth and you don't want to listen, Anybody ever tried to share Christ with somebody and they don't want to listen? And then you say it again and they don't want to listen? And they say it again and they don't want to listen? And no matter what you say, they don't want to listen? And you can see the resistance wall going up more higher and higher and higher and higher and higher? Jesus told the, told the disciples, if you see that happen, and just shake the dust off your feet and go somewhere else when you see that happen. But also continue to pray and continue to pray for people. Maybe there'll be an opportunity again later on down the line where the wall will be lower and you'll be able to have a good conversation with them again. But these guys, the Jews, have hardened their hearts. Jesus is a criminal. they got to convict him. They're not going to listen to anything. And he says, why do you want to hear it again? Very interesting. But then the the man who with new eyes shows a little frustration with their inquisition. You ever been in that situation before where somebody keeps asking you the same question and you give them the answer and then you go, look man, I've had enough. I've already told you this once. How many have done that with your children? (laughs) I've already told you this once. You know what the rules are. I don't need to explain it again. For you, So there's a little frustration in here. And then he says, you do not want to become his disciples too, do you? Man, talking about sticking a knife in and twisting it a little bit. What does he, he say that for? He's sarcastically mocking them, saying, you want to keep hearing the story about Jesus? You want to keep hearing how he changed my life? You want to become one of his people too? You want to come over to the, to the edge? And jump in and be part of the community? Boy, they didn't like that at all. But the other point of this is what we learned from that is he saw himself as a disciple of Jesus. You don't want to become a disciple too, do you? He tells these guys, I am a disciple of Christ. I know what the rule is. I know that anybody confesses Christ, they're kicked out of the synagogue. I don't care. I follow the Lord. If that's not an example of true faith, man, (laughs) under that kind of pressure, I'm going to follow Christ. Let me fast forward about 40 years from now when the police come and the government is controlled by the Antichrist. And they go house to house looking for believers to Jesus. And they have a law on the books that says anybody who confesses Christ, we take to prison and then we execute them. And they come to your house. Do you believe in Jesus? What do you say? Yes. Are you going to stand up? Are you going to show true faith? Are you going to say, yes, I am. He's the God of glory and he changed my life? I don't know if it's 40 years from now. It could be 400 years from now. But I know in the future, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. All who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted, it says. The end of the first part of the Sermon on the Mountain the end of the Beatitudes. Jesus talks about blessed are those who are persecuted for my namesake. Right? Persecution is going to come. And I think we get a lot more persecution than we realize right now. And it's, it's mild persecution. It's not over in your face. If you confess Christ, I'm going to fire a bullet in you. I remember being faced with a situation similar to that one time in my life, and I had to say, look, man, I'm here. I don't care if you kill me. (laughs) You're going to just send me to glory. 
What are you going to do is send me to glory, right into, right into the presence of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, what happens if the role was reversed and I killed you? Where are you going, man? That doesn't come natural. You don't do that with just human inside of you. You stand up when divine is inside of you. And I remember a guy in this church not too long ago asking me, I don't know, Jeffrey, if that happened to me, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I could stand up if somebody was willing to take my life if I confess Christ. And I said, man, you will stand up and you will not deny Christ if you are a believer because you have true faith. And inside of you is the Spirit, and the Spirit will not deny himself. That's what the Bible says, right? You are going to stand up, and when that persecution happens and it's overt and it's in your face, you're going to stand up and you say, I believe and I don't care what you do to this body because there's another one waiting for me in glory that does not have all the ailments that this one has. And the older and older we get, where the ailments start going higher and higher and higher, or lower, lower and lower, depending on your perspective of that, you'll get a lot more bold because your faith is stronger, you're more spiritually mature, and you realize there's a new body to come and there's a glory to come. And you will stand firm. This guy stands firm. I don't care what you do to me. I follow him. I am his disciple. That is denying himself. That is taking up his cross daily. The cross was an instrument of what? Death, right? Take up your cross daily. Be willing to die for your faith. He did that. He was willing to take away all of this opportunity in front of him, the new life, the new possibilities. He was willing to throw it all away and then follow him. This guy is a perfect example of somebody who did all those three things that Jesus said. What an example of true faith. Are we like that? I mean, think about this. It's, it's communion Sunday. We're going to have a time here in the future just to spend some time thinking about your life. That'd be a great question to ask. Am I Somebody like this blind guy who has new eyes. Would I do exactly as he did? Well, what was their reaction? John 9, 28 to 33, they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. Yeah, you may follow this guy, but I follow the commandments. I follow the rules. Jesus is a rule breaker. You're a rule breaker just like Jesus is. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. That's pretty interesting to me because how many times did Jesus tell them where he was from? He told Nicodemus, right? I'm from above. He told the Jews, I'm from above. I came from heaven. I came from the Father. It's been his whole message talking about where he came from. But the Jews, so blinded by their anger and hatred for him, can't even remember what Jesus said and don't even want to admit that he said it. So the man decides to instruct the Jews. What, are they, what does he say? We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. For since the beginning of time, it has never been that heard that anyone could open the eyes of a person born blind. If this man was not from God, he could do nothing. What's interesting is he probably is repeating the words that the Jews taught him. He's probably giving them back the same information that he heard from them. Boy, you really want to talk about putting somebody in conviction when you start giving back their words exactly as they said it back to them and say, well, what do you do? You're the one who taught me this stuff. Or as parents, do we say, do what I say and not as I do? <laughs> Nobody would have ever said that as a parent, right? <laughs> Do what I say because it is what I do. These guys don't like that their words are coming back to him. But the man's got a great point. If Jesus was not from God, 
he could do nothing. Nobody can do a miracle unless he's got divine influence in his life. We know Jesus is God in the flesh, but let's just say he's a prophet like Elijah. How could Elijah do, the, do a miracle without having God's presence in his life? What a great point. The works show that Jesus was God. He's in good company. Jesus said the same thing in John chapter 5. The testimony that I have is greater than the testimony of John the Baptist. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. He doesn't even, didn't even hear when Jesus said that in John 4, uh, 5, 24, but he certainly knows it. Again, you see the spiritual influence in this guy's life. He gets new eyes, and he's got the spirit inside of him that is instructing these people. The Jews don't care about the man's argument. They don't care at all. They don't want to listen to him anymore. They're done with him. So in John 9, 34, what do they do? They answered him and said, You are entirely born in your sins, and you're teaching us. You're nothing but a scummy former beggar, former blind sinner, and you're instructing the great Jewish teachers? <laughs> Get in your place. You ever seen that happen before where you can't win the argument, so you criticize the person? Yeah, that person's making a great point. Yeah, but you're ugly. <laughs> or you're short. Or you're a wimp. Or you only make $10,000 a year. You know? When you don't like what somebody's saying, you ratchet up the personal attacks. And that's what they do to this guy. They're fed up to hear this guy's going, you told me this stuff and you're not even following it yourself. Get out of here. And so what did they do? They put him out. They excommunicated him. They passed, passed him out of the synagogue. Your life was just about to begin. It didn't begin. Go back to being a beggar. That's where your prospects are in the future. You're, you're never going to marry in our synagogue. You're never going to get any business contacts in our synagogue. You're never going to have any social status in our synagogue anymore. You're out. Get out. Get out. But that's not the end of the story. Look at John 9, 35. What does it say? Jesus heard that they had put him out. What did Jesus do? He went and found him. Jesus heard that they had put him out. The scuttlebutt on the street, they kicked him out. What does Jesus do? I'm going to him. I'm going to go find him. I'm going to go check out how my guy is doing. I'm going to comfort him. I'm going to support him. I want to reinforce him. I remember a young guy sat in my car one day and he said, I just gave my life to Christ. And I'm like, yeah, what happened? All my friends went away. Yeah? How did that go? Well, it's a little tough. I mean, I hung out with him most of my, most of my time. He was a young kid, last couple of years of college, maybe. And I'm like, well, where am I taking you? He says, you're taking me over to my parents. My parents are Catholic. They're not going to like what I have to say. <laughs> and I said, isn't it interesting? I was driving Uber in Jacksonville at the time just to learn the learn the town and I said you have no idea man who you're sitting next to in this car and I said you realize I'm a, I'm a pastor and his eyes lit wide up and I said let me just encourage you man when your eyes have been opened and Jesus has impacted your life just give them the truth they may need, hear, they may need just to hear the truth and maybe they will listen to you because you're their son where they wouldn't listen to somebody else. I said, go be bold. Speak what happened to you. You don't need to know anything about the Old Testament. And he's go, that's a good thing because all I've read is the New Testament. And I'm like, well, good. You're on the right path. 
go be bold. And I dropped him off at his parents' house and I watched the smile on his face and he, he walked away and he turned around the door and he waved at me and he was ready for first mission to go and talk to his parents about that. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what his parents did with that. I don't know what they did in treating him or anything like that. But I do know one thing, Regina, I'm going to see the dude in glory because he had a changed life and he was willing to go straight into the mouth of persecution and anger and just say what happened to himself. What a great faithful testimony this guy is. And what happened? Jesus goes and looks for him. And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered and says, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? He'd never seen Jesus before, right? He interacted with him as a blind man. We don't even know that he actually knew what the Lord looked like. And so we see a little bit of that here. Jesus has to say, you've both seen him and he is the one who is talking with you. He's the one who gave you spiritual eyes. He's the one that sent the spirit inside of you that's allow you to be bold under all this persecution. He's the guy that's right next to you. And I came looking for you because I wanted to make sure you were okay. And I wanted to care for you. And I tell you, when somebody comes to Christ, the enemy will ratchet up attacks. When somebody is just working their way where the Lord is moving them over to Christ, the attacks will come up. The chaos will start ensuing. The adversary will throw every bullet, use every person that is his to try to distract somebody early on in life. Anybody ever experienced that before? You make, a, you make your case for Christ the first time and all hell seems to break loose literally in your life. Why? This is the war at work. God on one side, the adversary on the other. One of my guys is going astray. I'm going to throw every weapon over there to keep him in the fold. But what do we know from the good shepherd looking forward to next week's message? He left the 99 and went and found the one. Here's a great example of that. And so the guy tells the Lord, Lord, I believe. And it says, and he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Not only did he deny himself. Not only did he take up his cross under the fear of persecution. Not only did he follow him, fulfilling all the three things that Jesus said about a faithful disciple. But he worshipped him as well. That's the fourth pillar and Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Jesus came in the world as a crux point for judgment. We learned from John 3, 17, that the Son did not come into the world to judge the world, but to what? To save the world. That was the reason for the incarnation. But what does Jesus say here? For judgment I came into the world. He became the stumbling stone. He became the rock of offense. He was going to trip up the people who were self-righteous. He was going to trip people up because they couldn't see or consider that he was God right in front of them. And that's why he says, for this purpose I came into the world. Those who see will become blind, and those who are blind will have sight. He's talking about spiritual sight. And I remember a time in my life where I didn't have spiritual sight. All I had was physical sight. All I knew was what the world around me was. I didn't see any spiritual activity or spiritual light. There was a guy named Apostle Paul who was in that same situation I was many, many years before. And on the Damascus Road, what did he run into? He ran into a stumbling block. He ran into the Lord. And the Lord said to Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul had to deal with that stumbling block. Here you have a group of Jews. What did they do with that stumbling block? 
They fell all over themselves and started bleeding on the road. They couldn't handle the stumbling block in front of them. And so the Pharisees who were with them, who heard these things, said to him, We are not blind too, are we? What about us? Are we in a bad situation? And Jesus says, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. What is he saying? If you think you can get to heaven on your own, you're a blind man. If you think following the Ten Commandments to perfection is going to get you there on your own, you're a blind man because there's no way you can do it. You have no idea what you're talking about. I've heard somebody tell me many times, Jeffrey, I can, there's many ways to Christ. There's many ways to God. And yet Jesus said, how many ways were they to the Father? One, him. <laughs> That's the truth. You know what? Some people get offended when I say that. I'm sorry. I know you got the Koran. I know you think that you're following the way by following all the rules and getting to God. But the only way you're going to get to God is through Jesus Christ and ask for forgiveness for him. And they get mad and walk out. Or some great people in the community that are just nice guys. And we meet out at the golf course and we have a good conversation. And you know what? The only way to come to the Father, the only way to get to heaven is to come through Jesus Christ. What are you talking about? God's blessing me. Have you seen the new Cadillac in my yard? <laughs> You're blind. You're blind. The only way that you come to Christ is to realize you can't get there on your own. And when you say, Lord, I am blind, he will give you spiritual sight. John 3.18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. These guys were judged already because they had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The Jews have no excuse. The man who was blind didn't have an excuse until he said, Lord, I believe, until he recognized that he had spiritual influence in his life. So as we come to the communion table, what do we want to achieve in the communion table today? Is it just a ritual to us? You follow along and the pastor says, do this, do that, do this. If communion is that way to you, please repent from that and change your mind. This is an opportunity for us to evaluate our life. And as you bow your head with me and close your eyes with me, listen to a very simple question. Ask this to the Lord. Lord, do I exhibit true faith? Evaluate my life. Do I exhibit true faith? Am I denying myself? Am I taking up my cross daily? Am I following you? Lord, is there anything you've told me to do where I have said, I'm not going to do that? Lord, is there anything in my life that you want me to do and I haven't done it because I put it off? Have I not followed you when you said, go talk to this person about Jesus? Evaluate us, Lord, during this period of time not just in the congregation. Evaluate me, Lord. Evaluate my bride. Evaluate us. And do one of two things. Give us things that we need to do. Or give us the calm assurance that we are true faithful disciples of yours. Work with us, Lord. Work with us. In these few minutes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.